In the book The Martian, our hero Mark Watney is one of a, a team of astronauts on Mars that have to abandon their research base because bad things happen. <laughs> Not to spoil too much, but he did survive that. And one of the biggest challenges he faced right off the bat was establishing communication with Earth, which he did by finding the Pathfinder probe that NASA landed on Mars in 1997. He then proceeded to engineer the shit out of it to use its communication system to talk to Earth. It was a band-aid solution, to say the least, but in reality, communication with Mars bases is gonna be a huge challenge. One that's gonna require a lot of infrastructure and ingenuity to overcome. And even in the best case scenario, these issues around communication with Mars are likely to, over the long term, create a cultural rift that might never be resolved. When the Apollo astronauts went to the moon, their plan was to shoot some film, dig a little dirt, maybe play a little golf. They were explorers, just there to get an idea of what our little sister in space was all about. A little sister that's always around and never will go away and turns people into werewolves. The Apollo program, of course, was supposed to just be the first step in a long series of journeys to the moon to set up industry and bases and all kinds of stuff. But as of this recording anyway, it's been 50 years since a new boot print was left on the moon. And nobody liked that. Thankfully, as many of you viewers are already aware, NASA is planning on going back in 2024 with the Artemis program, and this time it's there to stay. Along with permanent stations on the moon, another goal of the Artemis program is to set up sort of a way station for trips to Mars. Now there are some who disagree with the moon to Mars strategy and want to go direct to Mars, but either way, some serious efforts are finally in place to, as Buzz Aldrin would say, get our ass to Mars. And the reasons to go are many, but one of the main ones is just long-term survival. There's a long list of scary world-ending scenarios from asteroids to gamma-ray bursts that could wipe out our existence on this planet. So if we want to avoid the fate of the dinosaurs, we have to become interplanetary. So if going to the moon was like Leif Erikson just kind of checking things out, going to Mars is going to be more like Christopher Columbus and those who followed him. We're going to stay. And just like the colonists in the Americas had to figure out how to survive on foreign soil, Martian explorers are going to have to figure out how to survive in Martian regolith only they won't have friendly natives to help them figure out how to survive and then, you know, pay back with smallpox. Now, another parallel is that when Christopher Columbus came over to the New World, he was seeking riches. He was trying to find goods that he could take back to Europe and, and sell. Unfortunately, some of those goods were indigenous slaves. But Mars colonies are eventually going to need some kind of economic driver. It's ridiculously expensive to get a person to Mars. Some people have put it at $10 billion per person. Something's got to pay for that. Now, the colonists in the Americas found land and resources they could exploit and trade. Mars doesn't really have a lot of valuable resources that we don't have here on Earth, and what is valuable there would cost way more than it's worth to get back. The now defunct Mars One mission planned on paying for it by basically turning it into a reality show and licensing it for entertainment value. Keeping up with the Martians, if you will. Now, Elon Musk has said that he thinks that the Mars colonies will pay for themselves through intellectual property, basically by, you know, selling the innovations they've had to create by figuring out how to live in this extreme Martian environment. Now, I don't know how the numbers work out for that exactly, but I can say that your home is littered with NASA spin-off technologies, so who knows? Actually, Mars spin-off technologies have already started. In 2019, NASA challenged companies and universities to come up with a 3D printable habitat for Martian use. The winning design's already been adapted and marketed for use here on Earth. And the Martian settlers are going to have to innovate and adapt in order to figure out how to live there because they're going to be pretty much on their own. Which is why I think there's a lot of parallels between New World colonization and Martian colonization. I mean, think about it. If you picked up and moved to the other side of the world today, it would be challenging in a hundred different ways, but you still would be in contact with everybody. You could call someone, you could text, you could have money wired to you, and you can always go back at any time. You, you have a lifeline. You know, the New World colonists in the 1500s, 1600s, they didn't have that luxury. Up until really about a hundred years ago, if you immigrated somewhere, you were saying goodbye to everyone pretty much for good. Communication across the Atlantic was abysmal in colonial times. Getting a letter from New York to London would take weeks or months. A lot of times it wouldn't get there at all. To get around this, actually a lot of colonial writers like Benjamin Franklin would make copies of their letters in books so that if the letter didn't get there, they could just send another copy of it. Or they would send multiple copies on different ships. This slow and broken form of communication just further isolated the colonists over the years, so it's easy to see why they, they stopped wanting to deal with some monarchy that would take months to address their concerns. And culturally, the two populations drifted apart. 
The colonists became aliens to the old world and vice versa. And you'd think that that's a problem from the past, that our Mars colonists wouldn't have to deal with this. After all, we're more connected now than we've ever been before. But there's a litany of challenges with communicating with Mars that could lead to a cultural isolation that we haven't seen in a really long time. The problem, of course, is the speed of light. The radio waves that we use to communicate travel at the speed of light, but even at that speed, the distance involved creates significant time delays. How much of a time delay? Well, that depends. You know, the, the moon, which stays in basically the same distance all the time, had about a one and a half second delay, but Mars, it varies wildly. The Earth and Mars circle the sun at different rates. Sometimes they're relatively close, sometimes they're really far apart. This is also why there are specified windows for launch to Mars. Historically, the closest Earth and Mars have been in modern times is 34.8 million miles, which happened back on August 27, 2003. This means time delays ranging between 3 and 22 minutes, or you could say a 6 minute or 44 minute round trip. Yeah, you're not gonna be doing any Zoom chats with that connection. So communication with Earth is gonna be relegated to mostly texts and emails, which would work fairly the same as what we do right now. But one thing that will be very different is the internet. When broadband became widely available in the early 2000s, we all became pretty used to instantaneous downloads. You know, if you click on a spatula in Amazon, you don't have to like take your dog for a walk while you're waiting for it to enter your cart. On Mars, the internet's gonna be more like a curated package that you sort of download daily, as opposed to the freewheeling distraction machine that it is here. If you wanted a browsing experience that was anything at all like what we experience here on Earth, you would have to have all this stuff downloaded to a local data center before you did so. So until Google can set up a Martian data center, what you would basically have to do is download, you know, all the sites that you want to read on the regular, but if you were to click off of that, you would have to sit around and wait or maybe go plant some potatoes. Now that sounds bad enough, uh, but that's actually a, a gross oversimplification of, of the problems involved, and, and maybe to get a better idea of what those problems are, we could look at how we communicate with Mars now. Today we communicate with rovers on Mars like the Curiosity rover through the Deep Space Network. The DSN is a system of large radio antennas in Madrid, Canberra, Australia, and Goldstone, California that maintain a constant connection with probes throughout the solar system as the Earth rotates. It is not, as I first thought when I heard the name, a system of wireless routers floating throughout the solar system. Data rates vary a lot with these vehicles. Um, Curiosity has to be really stringent about its power use, so if it needs to send, say, a higher res image back to Earth, it usually bounces it up to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which then sends it to Earth. And the MRO beams data at the whopping rate of 0.5 to 4 megabits per second. This is actually better performance than NASA expected out of this satellite, but seriously, imagine buffering an HD movie with that connection. Just to further this example, NASA has to pre-program Curiosity's movements in advance. It's not like just controlling an RC car from Earth, but in order to do that, it has to take high-res photos that they can then analyze and plot out its next moves. Photos like this. This shows the area Curiosity was scheduled to explore in the summer of 2020. It's cobbled together from 116 images, and the high-res version of this photo would have taken more than 20 hours to beam directly to the DSN. So instead, Curiosity bounces it out to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has a higher bandwidth connection and can send the data faster. The problem, though, is that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is orbiting Mars and is only in range of Curiosity for eight minutes out of every day. And during that eight minutes, Curiosity can only upload 250 megabits at a time meaning in order to get that information up to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter would take around 24 hours and 39 minutes, on top of which it would take another 3 minutes to 22 minutes to get to Earth. And even if we had bigger, more powerful signal transmitters on Mars, we would still totally lose contact with them every 12 hours as the planet rotates and those antennas are then facing away from Earth. Clearly some kind of massive infrastructure is going to be required in order to maintain constant contact with the bases on Mars, either some kind of deep space network style array of antennas on the surface so they can always stay in contact, or, as many of you I'm sure are already typing in the comments, a Starlink of some kind. And yes, Elon has talked about putting a Starlink system around Mars for that very reason. It's it's actually the easier option. But still, transmitting high data rates is going to require some new technology. For example, the journal Nature recently reported on an idea that's going to use visible light, uh, sort of a laser system, to transmit up to 10 gigabytes per second. That's 10 times the 1 gig speed that we enjoy here in our homes and in our businesses. Now that's plenty fast enough to avoid any data chokeholds, but that still can't fix the whole 6 to 44 minute round trip problem that I was talking about earlier. With our current understanding of physics, there's just no way around that. Let's face it, Mars settlers are going to be living a very different existence from those of us here on Earth. Both because of the communication isolation, but also just because of the, the crazy, harsh environment that they're living in. 
It'll be a long time before these colonies become economically sustainable, but once they do, it's pretty much impossible to imagine that they won't want their independence. And we all know what that means. Of course, should we expand further out into the solar system or beyond to interstellar colonies, this communication problem is only gonna get worse. It is inevitable that whenever we send people out to these places, they are going to become their own culture, their own civilization, even their own species. Unless, is there some way around the time delay? The short answer, no. The long answer, no. Okay, there are a couple of theoretical ideas worth mentioning. One of them is wormholes. I don't need to explain wormholes. You guys know how it works. The whole two points in a piece of paper that are far away and then you bend the paper and punch a pencil through it. That whole thing that they did in Interstellar, you know, after they were already in space for some reason. Yeah, somehow all the planning and preparation and training they did for this mission, they just ding dang somehow forgot to tell them how wormholes worked. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I love the movie Interstellar, but that scene always makes me cringe. Anyway, the point is a wormhole is just a shortcut through space. So you're not really breaking the speed of light. You're just going a shorter distance. That's true for Matthew McConaughey, and that's true for the photons that make up the radio waves we use to communicate. If there was a wormhole between here and Mars, that would not only cut down on the time it takes to, to get from here to there, it would cut down on the time it takes for our communication to reach there as well. Luckily, all it takes to create a wormhole is a charged black hole being held open by a couple of cracks in the fabric of space-time. <laughs> Crazy as that sounds, uh, both of those things are thought to exist out in space, and it's possible we could even learn to manipulate those someday. But before you get too excited, we're, we're talking about bossing around black holes here. I mean, that something like that would make splitting the atom look trivial. And while those cracks in space-time are thought to exist, they've never actually been observed. Though there is hope that the LISA Gravitational Wave Observatory might find something like this when it goes up in the 2030s. Now, in the meantime, there is another possibility, quantum entanglement. Put very basically, the idea is to encode yes or no values to a, a paired quantum particle so that when you measure the properties of that one particle, the property of the other particle can be known. There's a reason why Einstein called it spooky action at a distance, because it does seem to communicate instantaneously across any distance. Like imagine you have a pair of gloves and a couple of boxes, and you put one glove in each box in the dark so you don't know which glove is in which box. Then you send one of the boxes to a friend on the other side of the country. When your friend gets the box, they open it and tell you which glove they received. The moment they look in the box, you know whether your glove is a left or right glove. The state of those gloves is entangled. Entangled. And quantum particles work the same way, except like Schrodinger's cat before that box is open, that particle is in a superposition of states, or the glove is both left and right at the same time, and it could be 50-50. Once one particle is measured, or the box is opened, that wave function collapses, or the glove is determined to be left or right. Instantaneously, the other particle's wave function collapses, and it goes into a fixed state. So the thought, and it's an interesting one, is if you could force a proton spin from up to down, say, then its entangled proton would also flip from up to down. And if you could assign the up and down a one or zero, now you've got a bit. So consider what you could do with a million entangled particles, or a billion. You'd have instantaneous communication between computers over any distance. That's awesome, right? It's impossible. Unfortunately, there's no way that we know of to change a particle's state without it breaking the bond with that entangled particle. Remember that guy in Mystery Men that could only be invisible when nobody was looking at him? Yeah, it's like that. Maybe you should put some shorts on or something if you want to keep fighting evil today. Physicists have been trying to find a way around this for years, but so far, no luck. If a sustainable colony is ever built on Mars, it is inevitable that it will become its own culture and civilization. And that's not a bad thing, assuming we can treat each other with dignity and respect. We're good at that, right? <laughs> Living on Mars is gonna be different from living on Earth in pretty much every way possible. From living in pressurized environments, to how they grow their food, to how they make and consume their energy, to the very gravity that holds them to the ground. Once upon a time, explorers found a new world and settlers followed. Over the next 50 years, Mars is gonna be the literal new world, only with no natives to wipe out. Even with a Starlink-style system and some kind of high-speed data transfer technology, Communication between Earth and Mars is just going to be different and strained. And it's only going to speed up the process of turning humans into Martians. 
Thanks for watching, and, and let me know in the comments, is that something you'd be up for? You want to be one of the first settlers on Mars despite all the, all the problems? Talk amongst yourselves. And I want to give a big shout out to the answer files on Patreon that help keep this channel going, help me grow a team, and they're just joining, just becoming an awesome community, and there's, there's all kinds of smart people in there. Uh, there's some new names that I need to murder real quick. We've got Michael C. Anderson, uh, Daniel McCauley, Steve Vage, Voge, uh, Paul, Kenya Pierce, Harry W. Inman, Wayne Christian, Brian Wilhite, David Miller, Tavis McDonald, uh, Romeo Gonzalez, here we go, Ahienya Chikuwu Unawaha, Best I could do. Mike Hill, Grant Show, Moonsonator, Dry Frog, Curtis Himmel, Shovel, and Rustin Bonsai. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, exclusive live streams, all the goodies, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. T-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash store. Um, also hoodies, because it's getting a little cooler, stickers, uh, caps, I think, mugs, all kinds of stuff. Um, not only supports the channel, but also supports a great designer over in Prague. Uh, you can wear them, people will point at you and say you're cool, and you'll be like, yeah. I've actually been drinking from this mug as I've been recording this. Please do like and share this video if you liked it, and if this is your first time here, Google thinks you might like this video, so you might want to check that one out. There's all these others on the side that have my face on it, and if you enjoy them and you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. And that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.